as we come to come to church, I guess one of the things that are kind of um, essential to church or to being a Christian is this thing called sanctification. I was afraid of using that word until Ethan dropped it already, so I figured, okay, I might as well roll, roll with it. Sanctification, right? It's a big theology word. And essentially, it just means, you know, being like Jesus. It's the process of our lives where we, tr- you know, we look to be transformed to be more like Jesus. Right? It's a big part of what being a Christian is about. So we come, we understand who God is, we understand who Jesus is, and that he has shown us the example of how humans, how humanity are supposed to live. God designed us for a purpose. God designed us for a certain, to a certain way. And Jesus exemplifies that perfectly for us. So the goal of our lives, one aspect, is to come and be like him more and more and more as life goes on. It's that process we call sanctification. And, you know, <clears throat> I think when we come and, and do that, really, a word I'm going to use a lot today is this word sin. Because another way we can look at this process is that we stop doing things that God declares are sinful and replace those with things, behaviors, attitudes, character traits, habits that he believes are good, that things that he loves, things that he values. Right? And essentially, when we think of sin, we can think of any thought, or action, behavior that is you know, self-centered, selfish. And these are the things that hurt us and hurt others in the world. They're all the things that go against God's design and purpose for our lives. Now, what can kind of happen when you come, if you're, you're a believer, you experience this, I'm sure you have experienced this, as you come to know how God wants us to live, you notice there are certain things in your life that don't measure up to that. You begin to see how harmful they are to maybe you or, or other people in your life. And you're okay, I really want to get rid of this. I want to remove this, whatever this character trait, this behavior, this thing, this attitude that I have. I want it out of my life. I don't want it anymore. So we do the hard work, we come to God in prayer, down on our knees, we're asking for help, and we learn as much as we can, and we, we put into effect and work to get rid of this sinful, whatever it is, out of our lives. And you know what? We start having some success. God's there. He's leading us. He's helping us, giving us strength, and we're being faithful, going to Him every day. And as we kind of get this period of success, so it's getting a bit easier, a bit easier, we start thinking we've kind of got a hold on this thing. And then out of the blue, one day, we get just sidelined by it. We collapse completely into whatever that one sinful thing was that we've been working so hard to get out of our lives, to get out of our system. Have you experienced that before? Out of nowhere, boom, it's a big fall. It's not like the little slip-ups when we just get started, because we're like, of course, it's tough. You know, we're just getting started. After a while, after a period of success, and then all of a sudden comes this big failure. It really, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a blow. It's a blow to our hearts. It's like getting you know, cut out on the knees. And if you're here today and you're, you're, not, a, you're not a Christian, you know, this, is a, this is a universal experience. Like, there's so many you know, uh, things in the world about kind of self-betterment, self-help, you know, about you know, picking up good habits, getting rid of bad ones, trying to change your, your, your behavior to be more successful. This experience kind of happens to everyone. That we go for a period of time trying to change something that's deeply enrooted with us. And once we think we've got a handle on things, we're proven to be just so dramatically wrong. I had a problem like that uh, the other day, actually. Um, and, and I've shared here with you guys before, you from the pulpit or in discipleship groups, that one of the things that I try and get over a lot is, is anger and frustration. You know, when I there's certain situations where I can really just get heated up and get really frustrated. And the danger there is, is that, you know, obviously I let go, get emotional, I get ugly, throw a bit of a temper tantrum. People around me, you know, have to put up with that. And it's really not cool. And it's really uh, embarrassing for me, too, after the fact. And I had that problem, you know, the other day. And that's something I've, I've shared with. So something I've, I've prayed about, something I've tried to work hard on. And, you know, for a while, too, I've been able to, you know, see... You know, success in that. You know, for me, I've been able to have times where, like, God has given me a new perspective over my circumstances to prevent me from getting frustrated. So, ways that I can glorify Him and live the way Christ would live in those same moments instead of getting angry and getting emotional. But the other day, that didn't happen. And just out of nowhere, I found myself far too deep to be able to come back. 
and it really is a gut-wrenching thing to look back at. It's, it's a hard thing to acknowledge. I think one of the things that we maybe do when this happens is we try and just kind of downplay the whole thing because we don't want to stomach the fact of having such a big failure over something we have been quite confident in. But if we're really honest, it can be pretty alarming. Because then after I kind of get over it, you know, I, I realized I started getting into this period of disillusionment and discouragement. It's like, man, I should, I, I, it's not that I should know better, it's that I do know better. Right? I've experienced something else. And you think, how long does it take for us to get that? You know, when we're working through some sort of sinful behavior, some habit that we don't want, we've learned the hard lessons. We've seen the pain that it causes us and other people. We know what it feels like to have to, you know, own up to those sorts of mistakes. And then we've experienced doing things differently and seeing the benefit of that. And it's like, we know better. We know better. And then that discouragement, that disillusionment, that sets in. And it can stick for a long time. For me, I was sitting there thinking, like, well, three months ago I was preaching. Some of you guys remember this. I was preaching on, you know... Uh, uh, what was it? Not spontaneity. Impulsivity. Impulsivity and emotionally driven behavior. Like, come on. I preach on that. I know why that's bad. I should know better. We know that. Right? Then this period comes in. If we know better. We're discouraged. It's like, what does that mean about us? What does that mean about us? You see, when we have one of these collapses, that's why the title of our sermon today is Collapsing into Sin. When we have one of these collapses, we have two big problems that we have to acknowledge and we have to really be aware of. The first one is the act itself, right? Because we're doing something harmful, doing something that's hurtful, doing something that's wrong here. The action itself, that is something we have to deal with, we have to take ownership of, and also how we got to that point in the first place. Right, I'll bring that up, I'll come back to that too, but how we got there in the first place, that's a problem too. That's the first problem, but the second one also is this discouragement that sets in. This is what the devil likes to do, right? He comes in and fills us with accusation, fills us with doubt, fills us with guilt that shouldn't be there. And a whisper in our ears, this is really who you are. Just give up already. Give up. Walk away from this whole God thing. You're, you can't do it. You can't hack it. You're not good enough. This disgusting mess is who you are. That's what he's whispering. You know, like, you know this... Kind of like uh, uh, in those action movies or adventure movies, especially when someone gets like lost in the jungle and they get like when the character gets a little cut on his leg, it's like maybe a stitch. But then like five scenes later, he's like you know can't move. He's entirely like blue, full with like gangrene and sepsis because of an infection. Right? It always happens in some like adventure movie. This is like that. The wound originally is that collapse into sin, but that discouragement that sets in afterwards that just beats her. That's beats you down, that's the infection. And that's the infection that can kill and sticks around. Those are those two big problems. And I think if we look at, again, going back to this idea of well, what, is our, what is our life supposed to be about in the church as followers of Jesus is to keep following Jesus, keep imitating him in our lives. We need to keep getting back up and returning to our mission, even after we fail. And this kind of collapse is the kind of thing that can derail, derail us significantly. So it's a serious issue. And we have to be aware of that. We can't downplay that stuff, no matter how hard it might be to face the things we do that are wrong. What was interesting to me about Tuesday, no, well, it was Tuesday, but after I had this horrible morning, <clears throat> I was frustrated, grumpy, ugly guy. My wife, on the other hand, God lifted her up to help me out. She kind of came to me and said, look, I see how you're acting. You know, this isn't what you want for yourself. This isn't what you want to be. This isn't what God wants you to be. You know, I love you. Just, you know, go to God and it's going to be okay. And, you know, being faced with that kind of like, you know, loving face because she had that, that you know, her encouraging face on. I was like, seeing that kind of settled me down a bit. It was like, okay, I better just step back a bit. Then I went later on and, and in the afternoon, sat down for some sermon prep. It's like God kind of took a Bible and literally beat me over the face with it. Because as I turn to the page, we're gonna, what we're going to look at today, we have David, right? King David, well, he's not quite king yet, but David goes and he has this issue. He has a moral choice to make. And guess what? He fails. Dramatically fails. 
and he should know better because he's made the right decision in the past. And just before things were going to get even worse, God lifts up the woman in our story to come and knock some sense into him and say, hey, this isn't what you want to do. Stop and go to God. So it was kind of interesting for me today, and I want us to bring us through that together. So we'll turn uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 25. All right now, uh, 1 Samuel, it's a book of history in the Bible. It's a narrative. Really, 1 Samuel is not really just, just a narrative. It's like a collection of narratives. If you read through it, you notice there's kind of these different little stories that are compiled together. That's what the author does. When we come to a book like a narrative, we also have to understand a little bit about the genre so that we read it right. And there is intentionality in the compiling of these stories as they reflect and relate to one another. So if you were here last week, you can have a little bit of a refresher. If you weren't here last week, you'll get a little hindsight into what happened last week. Because chapter 24 relates and tells us about what's going to happen here in chapter 25. Not that these events were like one day and the next day. But it kind of appears in the story. There are things that happen in between. And I'm just going to mention it quickly like... You know, we'll see that actually, uh, if you read on your own, you'll see that Samuel, the big prophet, namesake of the book, dies in between these two stories. So there's things that are going on here in between that you know, aren't for us, aren't really important for us today to know about. But if you remember last week, we looked at chapter 24. And David, he's been on the run from King Saul. King Saul, you know, uh, has been told through prophecy that through his own disobedience to God, he's no longer going to be the king. He's going to be replaced. And they've got it figured out, yeah, the new guy is going to be David. Everybody loves David. David does, you know, he's obedient to God. And so Saul now seeks to kill David and those who are allied to him. So David's running around Israel, hiding with his group of like 600 soldiers, trying to avoid Saul. Last week we saw that David was hiding in some caves, and Saul went in looking and searching those caves for him. In a brief moment where Saul goes to have some private business and relieve himself in one of the caves, he's alone. It happens to be the same cave that David and some of his men are in, giving David the perfect opportunity to kill King Saul, the guy who's been trying to hunt him down, you know, and to treat him unjustly. He has this opportunity, but he doesn't take it. He cuts Saul's robe and then confronts him later on, saying, Look, Saul, I could have killed you. You are treating me unjustly. You're giving, you're just giving me evil when I have been loyal to you. You're trying to kill me. But I'm not going to harm you. I'm not going to hurt you for the evil that you've done with me. I'm going to call upon God as a witness to act as judge between us. I'm going to ask God to come and take vengeance for me for you. I'm not going to hurt you myself. And we saw how that was the right response. That David repaid evil with good and committed the problem, the full-fledged acknowledging the problem, to God. And then we come to chapter 25. And David's going to have the exact same question to face. We're interested in new characters here. We see that David is now uh, kind of still hiding out in some pasture land with, with, the, with these shepherds and a lot of these sheep. And they're owned by this guy named Nabal. Now, Nabal was a really rich guy. He's kind of like the oil baron of his day because he owns a lot of sheep. And wool are those, is that economic item in ancient Israel that really makes things go. This guy's super rich. He's got tons of sheep. Wealthy dude. And David and his men are hanging around the fields where he has his workers go. Now, in the ancient Near East, if you've got a bunch of like armed men, you kind of just take what you want and hurt who you want, and it doesn't matter because who's going to stop you? But David makes a point of treating Nabal's workers and his sheep with a lot of grace, a lot of dignity, and he actually acts as a bit of a protector, making sure that no one else comes in and hurts this guy's stuff. But the thing is, is that Nabal has a reputation for being kind of a nasty dude. He's, he's honestly, forget the language, but he, he's a jerk. Like, he's just not a nice person to deal with. He's like, selfish, he's rude, he's just a horrible individual. And now we see in the setting that at this time, it's the time where they would shear the sheep. Right? So that's like removing the wool from the sheep and selling it. So this is kind of for him the big cash crop time. Imagine here if you work for a salary, it's like your Christmas bonus. All right, that extra lump you have. If, you're, if you work... Uh, on your own, you're self-employed. It's like, you know, all your proceeds coming in at one time. Imagine, like, I don't know, extra clients or something. It's, this is the moment where the big money starts coming in. In addition to that, it's also a festival. So, again, imagine your Christmas bonus, and it's also Christmas. Like, this is the time when people are expected to be generous. This guy's got a huge payout, a ton of money, and, hey, it's party time. 
So David's kind of like, hey, perfect. I've been taking care of this guy's stuff. I've been treating this guy with a lot of dignity, with a lot of respect. He sends 10 of his guys to Nabal and says, hey, I've been doing a lot of good towards you. My guys need some supplies, need some food. Because remember, they're on the run for their lives from King Saul. Could you share with me some of what you have? Considering you're so wealthy and now you just got all this extra surplus. And basically, Nabal's response to David's men is get lost, punks. Go take a hike. Though probably a little bit more insulting than that in the original language. right? He completely rejects the request to help out. At the same time, it's a deeply, deeply insulting response for this guy, from this guy to David. He's not even acknowledging who David is. And remember, David was a a high-ranking guy in Saul's court. He was a really popular guy in all of Israel. So really, it's like throwing mud in David's face. So David, the guy who was so gracious towards King Saul in chapter 24, you'd think he would know the proper way to respond when someone treats you with evil. He forgot. He's so inflamed and enraged and insulted, he's ready to get vengeance. He has 600 men. He says, 200 of you guys stay guard the equipment. The other 400, get your swords on. We're going to go kill Nabal and every male in his household. So uncles, brothers, sons, hired workers, they're done for. That's how angry he is. Men, remember, this is ancient Near East culture. They don't take offense very lightly. They go from zero to 60 in some pretty drastic ways. David automatically collapses into deep sin. The exact opposite kind of response that he just had in chapter 24. Now on the other side, one of the servants of Nabal knows what's going on. He goes to Nabal's wife, this woman named Abigail. Abigail's kind of the exact opposite of her husband. She's kind of a wise, discerning woman, has her head on straight. She knows what's going on. Hey, this is David we're talking about. He's going to be the new king of Israel. And she knows, you know, God is on his side. Someone you don't want to mess with is someone who's going to be your new leader and who's got God on his side. Her husband's made a great mistake, and she needs to step in and save her family. So she goes, and remember, they're rich. So she loads up a ton of donkeys, makes this giant convoy of all the food you can imagine, right? Like bread, wine, cakes, raisins, all the stuff that they had. Loads up all of these donkeys and sends them to intercept David and his men. And then she comes to the tail end, right? Because she's wise and smart. She said, you got to butter the guy up with some presents and then make your appeal. And that's what she does. She goes in to save the day. And that's why I want to jump into the story and look at, starting with Abigail's speech to David. So if you'll turn with me, and we're going to look at chapter uh, verse 23 in chapter 25. Now I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit as I read because so she speaks with a lot of respect, with a lot of def- uh, deference. Because she knows who she's talking to. She's deferential. She's, she knows who she's talking to. She knows what's on the line. So she uses my Lord both for him and for God. Because, you know, my Lord, you know, my king. So I'm going to read a little paraphrase to make it a little easier to understand, but the original is going to be on the screen. So when, uh, when Abigail saw David, she quickly got off the donkey and knelt down with her face to the ground and paid homage to David. She knelt at his feet and said, The guilt is mine, my lord, David, but please let your servant speak to you directly. Listen to the words of your servant. You should pay no attention to this worthless fool Nabal, for he lives up to his name. His name means stupid, and stupidity is all he knows. I, your servant, didn't see my lord's, your young men whom you sent. Now, as surely as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, It is the Lord God who kept you from participating in bloodshed and avenging yourself by your own hand. May your enemies and those who intend to harm you be like Nabal. Let this gift your servant has brought to you be given to your young men who follow you. Please forgive your servant's offense, for the Lord is certain to make a lasting dynasty for you because you fight the Lord's battles. Throughout your life, may evil not be found in you. Someone is pursuing you and intends to take your life. There she's referencing King Saul. Your life is tucked safely in the place where the Lord your God protects the living. But he is flinging away your enemies' lives like stones from a sling. When the Lord does for you all the good he's promised you, 
and appoints you ruler over Israel, there will not be remorse or a troubled conscience for you because of needless bloodshed or your revenge. And when the Lord does good things for you, may you remember me, your servant. It's quite the appeal. It's quite the appeal, and a wise appeal. Because she brings up two things, kind of two things that she goes back and forth in repeating to bring this out to him. The first one is God's goodness and grace towards David. She reminds him repeatedly, God is protecting you, has been protecting you from, from falling into Saul's hands. He's tucked you away safely. He's taking care of you, and he's defeating your enemies for you. God's love for you, and he's also appointing you even king of the, of the, of the nation. Like he is, He's on your side. He's fighting your battles, right? This is what God is doing for you. And with that, we can see directly implied, if God is there for you and doing all this for you and taking care of you, why do you need to step in and take care of things for yourself? David, why do you need to take this matter in your own hands if God has been providing for you and giving you grace and giving you his love? And through that, then she points out, and reminds him that taking vengeance for himself would be sin. It would be disobedient to the God who has been showing him grace and showing him mercy and showing him love. Love. Right? And she says that multiple times. You know, once God gives you that kingdom, once God makes you king of Israel, you won't have to have the guilty conscience of having incurred bloodshed today. Reminding him that if he were to go and kill Nabal and the, and the men in his home, and men in his home, that guilty conscience would linger and tarnish his own kingship. Which is enough. It's hard hitting, and it gets right to the point. And you know, the, the, the thankful, the graceful thing is that it works. David then says to Abigail, "Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you to meet me today." Exclamation point. Really, blessed be the Lord God of Israel has sent you to meet me today. May your discernment be blessed, and may you be blessed. Today, you kept me from participating in bloodshed and avenging myself by my own hand. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord God of Israel lives, who prevented me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, Nabal wouldn't have had any males left by morning light. That's the response you want to hear. And then when you confront somebody who's deeply engaged and about to do something really bad, that's the response you want someone to hear. David, what's really remarkable is that he doesn't hold anything back. Kind of like we often do where we try and downplay maybe the wrongs that we've done. He fully comes to terms and admits, you're right. Had you not intervened, had, had I not really been confronted here, this is how bad it was going to get. This is how horrible I was going to act. I was going to avenge myself, and I was going to kill this, guys. All the men is there. He's admitting the depth of his sin. And then, you know, it's interesting. He doesn't really praise her. That. Like, he praises Abigail for her gifts, but it's not really directly towards Abigail that he's thankful and praiseworthy, is it? It's to God. And here I think as we come and, and, and look at this more deeply and how, it's, how it affects our lives, here's the big truth in this passage. The incredible truth in this passage is that ultimately it's God. It's God who saves us from our sin. It's God who saves us from our disobedience, from our brokenness. And it's God who brings the victory over those things in ourselves that we know we need to change. Right? God is the one who lifted up Abigail in this moment, who brought her in right at the right moment to say just the right words to get David to come to his senses. And as David acknowledges, it was God who, gave, who softened his heart so that he wouldn't actually react negatively and harm Abigail herself. And as I read that, I was kind of like, wow, I'm certain that in that moment, that's what God just came in and lifted up my wife to do that for me too. And he lifts each and every one of us up and other people in our lives at right moments in the time to keep us from going deeper into our own 
hurtful and harmful and selfish behaviors and actions. Often we maybe don't see it, but he's there. There's this um, 17th century theologian church leader uh, by the name of John Owen. He was an English Puritan. If you're familiar with the Puritans at all, they have a reputation of being kind of obsessed with sin and fighting sin. That's kind of their thing, what they're known for. So this guy kind of is the expert in that field. And he mentions that God has two ways of hindering sin in our lives. One is by his providence where, and it's on the screen, where he obstructs the power of sinning of, of the sinner. And two, by his grace, whereby he diverts or changes the will of the sinner. These are two ways in which he works. And this is kind of the everyday process of our lives. This is how God works in our lives after we've come into a relationship with him. And he steers us to be more like Jesus. That's kind of what we see here today, that second one, where he changes the will, changes the heart, the desire of the person who's about to engage in something harmful, engage in something that doesn't align with God's purpose for their lives. It's not like he comes and zaps us. He comes in and comes through the people around us, the community around us, and speaks truth into our lives through one another. And you know, this shouldn't surprise us. This shouldn't surprise us because, really, this is what God has always done. This is what God does from the beginning. In the beginning, we go to the cross. And there we see that Jesus, when he died, when he was crucified, he died as a sacrifice for all the ways in which we've disobeyed and rebelled against God and rejected him in our lives. And now if we take on that sacrifice personally, as for us, then God grants us forgiveness. In forgiveness comes a removal of the penalty of, of rejection. The penalty that comes from disobeying God, that is removed. That's freedom. That's a freedom into a relationship with Him. And when we engage and we have this relationship with God, He gives us His Holy Spirit. A part of Him that comes with us at all times. At all times. Giving us the, the ability working through us so that we can do things that honor God, do things that please God, do things that God wants us to do, so we can love like God. We can act like God would act. And we can love the things that God would love. Really, our victory over sin, it begins and ends as a work of God. It begins and ends as a work of God. But we participate. Right? That's that balance. We do participate. We can't just sit in our chairs, sit in our couch, and think that God's just going to like magically do things for us. We participate. But ultimately, it is God himself that makes our participation effective. That's really important. As much as we are called to follow in Jesus' footsteps and put our efforts into doing that, it is God's working through us and in us that makes our efforts effective and make changes in our own lives. So where did David go wrong? As we conclude, where did David go wrong? It's kind of like asking the question, where did we go wrong? Where did I go wrong the other day? And whatever situation might have been in, in your life recently or, or a little while ago, where, where, where did you go wrong? And I think, I really think a big part of it comes down to pride, to human pride. You know, I look at David, right? He is offended. He's offended. He's just been insulted, right? So it's not, it's insulting his position, his namesake. It's also rejecting his gesture, uh, his good gestures and good actions towards Nabal. What happens when you get rejected and you get insulted, right? get hurt, you know, offends our dignity, offends our sense of self-importance, affects our pride. His pride is stung before his men who are following him and into battle. Not only that, I think, you know, as time has gone, David surely has that sense that the rest of the country has that he's going to be the new king. He is very much aware of God's protection over him and God's closeness to him. He sees this time and again in his encounters with Saul. And surely on some level, David is, is growing in a sense of self-importance because of God's blessing on his life, God's providence in his life and keeping him safe. 
and the future promised to be the new, next king of Israel. Think of all these things coming up and probably giving David a bit of a bigger ego than he may have had in the past. And his pride is stung. And he goes crazy. Not only that, I think also that sense of spiritual connection with God that he's had has probably made him a bit lazy. Spiritually lazy. It's kind of like, you know, when you have that success and you feel like you're close to God, you begin to trust in your own ability to do what God wants you to do. Right? And I can imagine David at this point is probably trusting that, you know, he's probably got it worked out. He's been following God. He's called a, God, a man after God's own heart. That He's probably pretty good at discerning right from wrong on his own. And that's the kind of thing that happens to us, too. After we've been having success in following Jesus, and we've been seeing, you know, hey, I've been changing, I've been doing this, I haven't been doing this stuff that has, used to be harmful, I'm doing some good things now, things are going all right, we begin to think that we've kind of got a handle on this then. we kind of got it figured out, and we're, you know, we're not so bad, we're pretty good. That happens. And that's pride. And that's a really dangerous place to be in. It's a really dangerous place. Because remember, it's not on us alone. It's not our participation alone that makes changes in our lives, but it's God working through us. And in those moments, we start leaving God out of the equation. We stop turning to God. We stop asking God for his help the same way we once did. We stop relying on God and taking more, on it, more of it on ourselves. And in that moment, the lion of sin starts to crouch and getting ready to pounce when we least expect it. Because that whole process where we start thinking that we've got this on our own, it's like taking off our armor one piece at a time. The enemy doesn't rest, and he's just waiting there to keep to strike that, strike that blow. You know, there's a, another quote I want to share with you by a guy named Thomas Akempis. He was a, like a, a medieval uh, priest, and he wrote this discipleship manual on spirituality. Now, it's a medieval book, so there's some kind of weird stuff in some of the theology, but there's some really great insights, spiritual insights as well. One thing he wrote in his book, um, The Imitation of Christ, says, each day we ought to renew our resolutions and arouse ourselves to fervor as though it were the first day of our religious lives. We ought to renew our resolutions and arouse the fervor that we once had as, as if it was the first day. It's a challenging, challenging challenge. Think about it. The first day. The first day that you came to understand how just ugly, how broken, how bad, whatever some sin was in your life. How hard things were dealing with this one issue. How big the monster, how big the task it was to have some sort of change. Think about where you were then. The headspace that you had. We were humble, right? We were humble. We knew we couldn't take it on our own. We knew that we needed God's help. We were a bit scared, maybe. Not sure how things were going to turn out. We took things one step at a time. Kind of like hanging on, you know, um, by the hand of God, trying to make sure that we didn't slip up. We were careful. We were resolute. We were firm. Every day, when you woke up, mindful of this part of you, this this horrible habit. Whatever it is, you can think about it like addictions, you know, uh, white lies, you know, not being able to give your buddy 20 bucks and just say let it go because you have this thing where you can't let go of even any, let go of a penny. Maybe it's pornography. Whatever it is, these things that we know, we want to just get, get them out of our lives. When we started on that commitment to turn to God, to be changed and transformed, there was a seriousness and a gravity that we just held deep in our hearts but we let go of once we started seeing success. No. Each day we have to treat like the first day. And every day in the future like the first day. That's the framework. That's the picture of our participating in God's work and transforming our lives so that we'd be more like Jesus. And as we know, the more and more we become like Jesus, the more we're able to and better able to love our neighbors, love our families, to be there for one another, to be a force for good in this world. Otherwise, when we just act out of our selfishness, we know what we pour out, the hurt and harm that we ourselves face from others. 
So brothers and sisters and friends, I want to leave you off with this reflection. And simply is to go during the week in your time of prayer and the Holy Spirit is to reflect in our own hearts. If we're at a point where we've already kind of taken this collapse, then it's far too late. Right? It was too late for me the other day. Because the seeds that planted that moment were already done a long time ago. We have to seek out that sense of pride. Seek out that sense of that sense of, of, of like that well-being that we shouldn't have. That fearlessness over our own sin that, that we've now developed. We have to go back and ask God to bring us to mind the first day. The first day and that we would rely on Him constantly. Let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, God, we are so inundated in a culture of self-reliance that it can be really difficult for us to ask for help. And even when we do, we're very quick to shed it and want to go it on our own and rely on ourselves. But Father, we know that is not your way. The message what we see in the life of Jesus is that we need you. It means to rely on you for every step. God, that is what you have made us for, and that is where we'll find a great joy and our great peace. And really the rest that our souls are crying out for. God, I pray that we would come to you. We would come to you every day for your strength, for your guidance, as though it were the first day that we met you, coolest and helpless, God. And may you lead us. Lead us in all things. In Christ's name I ask. Amen.